Welcome to Ear Biscuits, the podcast where two lifelong friends talk about life for a long time. I'm Rhett. And I'm Link. This week at the round table of dim lighting, we're having a little listening party. Congratulations, Rhett. It's finally happened. Your freaking album is out. I mean, not when we're recording this, but yes, when you're listening. <laughs> I'm in celebration mode. Uh, James in the shame. Uh, Rhett's alter ego where he plays music that is sincerely uh, sentimentized and oh. sincerely great. Oh, I, it is my man. pleasure to sit here and listen to it with you and kind of talk through each song, you know? Yeah, this is uh, like a listening party. I'm, I'm gonna take more, I'm gonna take a, you know, a, a journalistic approach at times. Okay. Like an NPR kind I of have thing? a I have a notepad here. Oh, that's intimidating. Whereas I'm going to jo- maybe make s- some jottings that then um, will will lead to you exposing the truth behind oh. behind these songs. That, but uh, but I, also the, I just got all the music off of a royal, royalty free <laughs> site and just sang over it. <laughs> Is that, you want me to admit that finally? <laughs> what if? Okay, up first, go for it. Um, so that would be hilarious. again, the album is Human Overboard. The whole album is out Human. now, wherever you listen to your music. What we're gonna be doing is listening to all 11 tracks in album order. Uh, we're actually gonna, as you're listening to this, you're not gonna hear the full track because we're not gonna just play the full song for every single song. We're gonna listen to the full song. So we we might reference something that is in one of the full songs that you didn't hear because we're gonna play like a portion of the song to give you the feel and the vibe so you can listen to the album on your own time. Um, so that's, that's what we'll do. And I wanted to do, I'm actually gonna take these out because I'm actually not listening to anything right now and it makes my voice sound weird. Yeah, I already had to do that. Um, I'm gonna do what they used to do in the old movies and I'm gonna do the credits first because I don't wanna just put the people that I wanna thank at the end and you're just like, oh, I've heard the whole album and then I'm done. And so oh. you might wanna, fa- I mean, if you decide you wanna fast <laughs> you might forward. Fast forward through, no, through I'm it. saying, you might decide that you wanna fast forward, but don't because the one of the coolest things about this whole project is has been the collaborative nature of it coming to fruition and being what it is. It's, you know, I had a lot of people who made me uh, sound the way that I sound and, and shape these songs and shape the whole project and I, that I collaborated with on different parts of it. So I wanna just start by thanking them. Uh, oh. st- do, you, do you have a list? I do. First of all, I wanna just start with. Now you haven't won an award, I just wanna clarify. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I haven't. Maybe you will. Uh, you, well, okay, what well, kind of award? Like, <laughs> I'm just saying typically like, you, know, you thank the, people. The, the, the Daily Record, this is, is, this the is. Daily Record is gonna be best album of the year from a guy who used to have a studio in Lillington. <laughs> yeah, you could get a Chamber of Commerce award at least um, for this thing. No, I'm just saying this. these are the people who made this project what it is. Shout them out, man. So first of all, the person who played the biggest role, Derek Furman, my producer who of course we got to know. I love me some Derek. We got to know through Britton, uh, Link's cousin, because he was recording some stuff with him and he's done some stuff for the Mythical Society for our you know, our collabs that we do over there, the vinyl that we do. And you know, the reason I decided to go with Derek on this project isn't because he had ever done any country or folk music, he's a pop guy, but because he is so committed to making things work and he was so committed to learning the process, and he learned. He like he told me multiple times. I'm learning so much about this type of music hmm. as we, you know, as we make these songs. And again, the way that it worked is, I would write the lyrics and the music, basically me and a guitar, singing to a certain beat, the BPM. That's a beat per minute. Yeah, and I would send him that, and that is the Beats backbone of everything that uh, that he then then create. If it was one beat per minute, that would be slow. Very, Sorry, go that's ahead. Like a, that's whale music. Yeah, uh, but then he would kind of send back because again, I have another job, actually several other jobs that I do here at Mythical. So this is uh, has been a side project and a hobby. So I haven't been able to devote the kind of time that typical people typically people 
devote to this kind of thing. So I would send him these demos and then he would come back with like, he's like, hey, here's what I'm thinking about the bass line. This is kind of what I'm hearing in a drum groove kind of thing that then we would then send off to other people to add their pieces. It was like so collaborative and so many steps to finally get to the final song. But he was the one that was guiding that process to kind of be like, here's what the, he would send me a bunch of options and he would send me, but really it was his ear and his instinct with these different musicians that he hired that made these songs go from a guy playing something on a guitar to what you end up hearing on the album. And he was just so intimately involved in making it what it is. So I just wanted to start, big thanks to Derek Furman. You would be lucky to have him as a producer on your project. He yeah, stay, he stays a lot of people, they don't really, but... you know, if, if you've not experienced it, sometimes it's hard. Well, in hip hop, it's actually, you know, that a lot more credit is given to producers, but like, Growing up listening to music, I really didn't think about the producer's role. And so everything you just described is not necessarily something that is just because of your situation and all the different directions that you've been pulled in that you needed to like give it over to Derek or something. I think you're describing what a good producer does, which is oh, yeah. know, something that I didn't appreciate at first and like, helping bring shape and cohesion and specific direction to songs that are in their rawest form. And also you know, he, a producer can make or break a song entirely. And he's a, and where, he's a musical, he a great producer is also a musical director. Somebody who he's like, hey, uh, let's try that again and give me a little bit more softness or give me a little bit more emotion in that. Or, you know, e even a couple of times, this didn't happen on every song, but there were a couple of songs where he was like, ah, the phrasing of that part is kind of bumping me. Mm -hmm. And we would sit there and we would try to figure out like, oh, I'm gonna use this syllable, I'm gonna use this word here, and like locking it in so there's not things that bump you throughout the album. So he was integral in that process. Another person that did so much, Alex Straley. The first time I, I talked about Alex, when we talked about Believe Me, I mispronounced his last name, I think I said Strahl. <laughs> Oh, Straley. So Alex is just, a, he's a multi-instrumentalist musician here in California, in Los Angeles, uh, who's in a couple of bands, but he's also kind of a session guitar guy. And he, and Derek knew him, you know, originally with so much, like we wanted to do pedal steel, we wanted to do obviously like country sounding guitar in places. We, we wanted banjo, we wanted mandolin. He, Alex did all of that. So originally it was gonna be like, Derek was like, I gotta have to talk to some contacts to get some Nashville guys to do these authentic country parts. Hmm. And then he's like, and then he, he didn't really have any luck with that, but he's like, hey, I, I, I know a guy in, in, in Pasadena, Alex Straley, who he's got all these old guitars and old instruments, like the pedal steel is a 1946 instrument. Wow. Uh, that's not even a pedal steel, it's a multi-chord, it's, it's a, something, it's kind of a predecessor to a pedal steel. Really? That he engineered to be able to, because uh, you know, basically the way uh, the multi-chord, you would hit a pedal and it changes the whole chord that's being played, right? He found a way to make it where he can, uh, he, he like, he does all this, he manipulates all these instruments and stuff and he basically engineered this thing to make it into a pedal steel, but that's not technically what you would see as a as a lap pedal oh, steel. Oh, a pedal steel, you play the chords with your feet? With your feet, so a pedal. How many pedals are there? Is it like an know. organ? I don't know. What? I haven't seen it. Yeah, because when that's they're the playing, that these, they're striking. These were, these were remote, in some senses, rem I think, yeah. They're like on a they're like on a live session with each other that I could tune into while I was doing my job, but I wasn't there when there's actually doing it, right? Did you ever meet Alex in person uh, at all? By the time this podcast is being recorded, I I will because no, no by the we time are recording this it. Podcast is live because I wanted to go out with Derek and Alex because they were the two like. Yeah, they're they're also local. So you have local. plans to meet him, but you still have not well, met. Him. I want to do a cel a celebration yeah. dinner with them. So yes, we will have done that. Uh, but anyway, Alex is, again, he's not a country guy. He just has great instincts. And I think it ended up bringing this awesome vibe to a lot of the, so the way that I would describe it, 
is if you are impressed by guitar that you hear on the album, it's him, not me, right? I can play, you know, I'm, I'm proficient, especially as a songwriter when it comes to, I can do what I need to do on a guitar to write a song and to kind of keep a rhythm and do a picking pattern and that kind of thing. But like, if you're impressed by it, chances are it was him doing it. All right, who else you got? Uh, Gunnar Olsen did all the percussion and all the drums. It's a good name for uh, someone to do something. And this is just a dude who's a session drummer in New York, who has worked with a bunch of big stars. He did all he did all the percussion on Springsteen's uh, Western Stars album. He's worked with Miley Cyrus and you know a bunch of people who are more talented and more prolific than me. Uh, but again, Derek had a, is, 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 knows him, and he knew he could do this kind of like Americana style, and he nailed hmm. it. So thanks to, to Gunner. I'll talk about more musicians once we get into individual tracks. But again, I want to talk. I want to thank Anna Weber who took all the pictures for the whole thing. Like so, any pictures where I look like I might be a legitimate uh, artist or feeling shame, yes, while the picture's being taken. That was Anna Weber. Thanks to Anna Weber, the album art. Uh, for the album, you know, the me in the water on the front, that was illustrator Greg Newbold who painted that, uh, digitally painted that. Uh, and I don't think he's done much album art. He's just like a legit like artist painter who does like gallery work and stuff. And uh, it's cool. we, you know, Kara helped me find him online and he did an incre incredible job. Kendrick Kidd, who we used to work with a long time ago to do Back a lot in the of day. design. He designed the James and the Shame logo. And, okay. then, and then Kara, uh, Kara Powers, uh, our assistant. Kendrick designed the first Good Mythical Morning logo. The flame. Yeah, 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 see? Uh, yeah. And uh, uh, the Rhett and Link logo that has us, we look like one chess piece, like two faces facing. Yeah, the two heads, the, the one head and two faces. Yeah, he also um, did that. Yeah, so, and then Kara Powers, our assistant, who spent a lot of her time working on this with me and finding these talented people. So it was just so cool because I just, you know, we haven't done anything like this in a while because we have this incredible team here at Mythical that we have an idea and the team implements that idea. But this was kind of more the old school way we used to work, which is like, hey, we need somebody, let's find somebody online that we like their work and we can just collaborate with them. Yeah. It was really cool just when you bring somebody into a process and they make something into what it is. So, uh. Well, without further ado, we can start listening oh. to the song, but you know what, we might as well just talk quickly um, so we don't break up the album. Yeah. Let's talk about We're Still Good. We're Still Good! We're Still Good! Uh, this is the party, party game, game from for Mythical. You, for all of your friends to get together, you play a card, it has a blank, it's a crazy scenario that then everybody submits what they think should fill in the blank, person chooses what makes that scenario horrible, and then everybody needs to write a positive spin saying, we're still good, to turn it into something positive. So it's like, it's a very fulfilling it's, game. It's good for your soul, it'll make you laugh, it'll also help you reframe things if you're into that therapy. Which is important, I think it's important. Reframing, it's like language stoic, is important. Stoic philosophy. Um, yeah, we, we heard from a therapist that said they were using it in that context. We're still good, available at amazon.com. It took me a while to figure out uh, what the album order is going to be, and actually this process right now is committing me to the album order. Oh, okay. Well, okay, yeah, I gave some input into this, so I'm curious actually, how it's gonna I, shake out. I uploaded them, I uploaded the songs yesterday. I could technically change I have it, not listened to them in album order before now. Um, Believe me, the first single has been out. We've already listened to it once, but uh, it's gonna, we gotta listen to it again. All right, here we go. Cause of 
First single, we, you know, we've already talked about this one when, when the single came out, so I don't wanna retread any of that ground, but we have the benefit of like, you, you've heard the most fan feedback from this song because it's been out the longest. Mm -hmm. You know, what's, so one, I'm kinda curious about like, what's, what's that experience been like? What are, are, are people, are people getting it? Are people, you know, what is it, what kind of conversations is it leading to? Because most of the people who are listening, at this point, listening to my music are people who are already fans of us. Yep. Uh, we're getting like the the reaction to this type of music from people who are just fans of us, which doesn't mean they're fans of country music. Now, we have a subset of Mythical Beasts who are fans of country music, but the most common First of all, the response has been so positive from a musical standpoint. I'll talk about, you know, thematically that response, but surprise, you know, people are like, yeah. oh, I, you know, I didn't, people do this kind of thing all the time, right? And it's a trope. It's a trope for if you're doing this one thing in entertainment, you're like, you always just think, I can also do music, <laughs> you know? I think the thing that is a reminder to people. I think podcast is the new version of that, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, is that we started our career as musicians. So that's actually, this is going back to the basics for me in a lot of ways. The first thing we ever did professionally as entertainers, it was music based. But people you know? are still surprised because you know they come they come on board at certain points. And, yeah, right, it's always like, you what, you, you, you do this? I mean, we, we've had fans of our music for years who are like, oh, yeah, what about a serious album? So it right. kinda scratches that itch for them. Yeah. But there's a lot of people who, yeah, it's like, they did, Never knew what sound it would be that it would be so country. The the most common response is, I'm not a fan of country music, or I hate country music, but I love this. And it's interesting, I'm seeing the same exact thing, because you know when we're recording this, I just put Where We're Going, the second single out. The same exact reaction uh, in terms of, I don't like country, but I like this song too. And a lot of people are now saying, hey, it's not that you don't like country music, it's that you've been listening to the wrong country music. You've been listening to radio country music. You've been listening to what's popular on the radio. Of, nobody listens to the radio anymore, but you know what I'm saying. It's a certain type of sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all these songs about trucks and you know, God and country or whatever. And it's like, this is not, this is not that. And I think people, it's like, oh, you actually do like broadly country, folk, Americana, what, however, there's multiple ways to describe it. Yeah, this. you're turning people onto it. Um, well, I wanted to uh, shout out a couple of moments. Okay. Well, I, the one lyric early on when you say, because the one I gave you said that that ain't it. I like that lyric because it's, you've got the you, which is the end of one sentence, the beginning of the next sentence, right? Am I hearing that right? Uh, no. Because the uh, one I gave you said that that ain't it. No, it's because the one I gave, you said that ain't oh. it. Oh. But you can hear it that way. I always, I just, I always hear wrong. it. I always hear it more colloquially. It also makes sense that way. I gave it to you. You said. Well, that, that I mean, ain't that's it. what I'm saying. Yeah. It is what you're saying. But you actually didn't do what I thought you did. No, I just now said. Because the answer? one I gave, you said that ain't it. Yeah, that makes more sense. But it's also the one I gave you. You said that ain't it. That needs to be how you, how you, you need to take credit for that. Okay. Okay, I did it on purpose. What about, um, you know, in the chorus, or it, you say my heart was never true, that may say more about you. Is that the type of thing that it speaks for itself, or? I'm curious, well, what, it, what does it say about people? Well, 
I don't know. They, it's, that's for them to figure okay, out. Okay, yeah. I respect but, that. But I, I think that, you know, the reason that this is the first song is because it's is just what I explained before. Musically, I think it kind of sets the tone. But thematically, like, the album order, more than the musical progression, I, I, I leaned into the thematic progression of, like, if you were to sit down with me and I were to begin talking to you about my deconstruction, which is not even really something that I want to do unless somebody starts asking me about it. Um, especially now, I don't, you know, I'm not interested in changing people's minds as much as I may have been at an earlier point. But like, what is the process that I would that I would lead you through as I was kind of trying to explain myself, right? This is kind of, this is obviously a super self-indulgent project on multiple levels, but also just the fact that I think I got something to say and that you should listen to it right in there as self-indulgent. But if I did, if I am talking to you, regardless of where you're at on the spectrum of spiritual deconstruction, Christianity, whatever, this kind of sets the tone of saying, the point of this is not for you to agree with what I'm saying. The point is just listen, to, if somebody is gonna tell you about their spiritual experience, take their word that they're the closest to it as they can possibly be and that they're being honest with you in what they're saying. And so if your perspective at the end of the day is that, oh, you never were a Christian, and you may be committed to that because of some theological perspective that you have, again, that says more about you. In that instance, if you think that I wasn't a Christian, that's not, actually, there's nothing about me that demonstrates that I wasn't a Christian. It's you and your commitment to a specific ideology that makes you see me in a certain way. So when you say my heart was never true, this says a lot more about you than it does about me and my experience. Yeah, and who wants to talk to somebody who's not gonna listen to, who's not going to believe what they're saying, but instead just try to put them in a box and like mine their true motives. Like assuming that you're lying to me, I'm my goal in this conversation is, is to find the, the real truth. That's what I'm gonna do here today, Red. <laughs> Just kidding. No, I like I know how that feels. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we we felt a lot of that, right? Uh, and I think it's I think it's the perfect start to the album. So before I move to the next song, I want to I want to thank uh, Casey well, Frank. You're gonna who, thank people every time who, who huh? play. Well, as we get new instrument, okay, instrumentalists. All right, all right, fine. Casey Frank play that organ. That's a real organ. Like we had a fake organ in there originally, and then I and I was like, man, you know me, I'm not a details guy. It's like, but Derek's like, you know, we gotta get a real organ. And I'm glad he did. There's no fake instruments in any of this stuff. Uh, that was recorded by Tally Sherwood at Tritone Recording. And uh, then the uh, okay, the music video, the lyric video slash music video, again, that was done by Jax Anderson, uh, who she makes incredible music on her own and does incredible directing. And so shout out to Jax Anderson. Buddy System season one theme song. Yes. That's right. Yeah. Um, okay, for the second song, this may be a surprise to you. This is actually responding to some input that I got from you, but also as I really started thinking about what I, there was a point at which I thought I was gonna do the first three singles were gonna be the first three songs on the album, but then as I, I started thinking there's multiple things going into this, because you're like, who am I thinking about when I, I'm thinking about the listener. Am mm -hmm. I thinking about somebody who's like, who's it? I like country music. Who's this new kid on the block? Or I'm a fan of Rhett and Link, and I don't even like country music. But what's Rhett got to say here? I couldn't decide who I was making that thing for, so I just stuck with themes, and it just ended up being that we're still very in like classic country on the second song. I went with Flash of Rationality, okay, okay. as a second song, and we can talk about it after we listen to it. All right, I'm ready. Sometimes I have a flash of rationality, but most times I do just what I'm going to do. It's easy for me to see what I already see. Ain't got time for inconvenient truths. I'm just a man, I ain't no machine. I do the math the way it suits me. Don't get me wrong, you're making some sense, but I think I'll go. 
Sometimes I start I love that one. I mean, it goes even more country. Like it's probably the most country. right right down the middle. But it's, I mean, it's got this very vintage country vibe. Yeah, you know, you know how when it's you got hear, a Charlie Crockett type. Well, when retro. you hear something in your mind, it's one of those things where, like, what I was—that's my homage to Merle. You know, that's why there's a trumpet okay. in there. That's my homage to my favorite era and your favorite era of Merle, late seventies, early eighties, when he was yeah. like bringing in jazz. Yeah, and of course, once I put my spin on it, it's going to be—it ends up in a different place. So it's, you might have to be told that that's the reference. But the reason I did—I I put this, that song there. Is again, I want to be like, hey, we're still. This is a country album. Um, it's the shortest song on the album. It's under three minutes. It's the only one that's under three minutes. And so I kind of want to be like, all right, from a streaming perspective, it's like I'm into this album. I get through that second song. Mm -hmm. But from a thematic standpoint, it's kind of saying, listen, first song, I told you, you don't have to agree with me. And in the second song, I'm telling you, I also don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, it's, it's it, self-deprecating. It, like, I'm like. This I'm not. I don't think I got something incredible to say. I don't think I've got some incredible insights into this. I think that I'm smarter than I actually am. I buy a lot of books. I don't finish reading them. Sometimes I think straight about this stuff. A lot of times I don't. I'm just being honest with you. This isn't some treatise that you're supposed to like be aligned with what's going on here. I'm just guessing it the same way that you are. You know, it's kind of the thematic message, and that's why I wanted it to be at this point. And that trumpet. Yeah, it's like I mean, it is a surprise first time you hear it. Like I mean, I heard it a lot later in the album before. It was like maybe four from the end when I heard it, and I was like, "Oh, you gotta, you gotta move this up." Especially with the when that trumpet came in, it's like, "Oh, you give people this surprise." Well, I've got a funny story about the trumpet. So I knew from the beginning that I wanted a trumpet, and the way that I indicated that I want a trumpet is when I sent Derek the demo, which is just me playing a guitar and singing. I just it got to that part of the song and I just did a mouth trumpet. Yeah, as you would, I guess. And uh, nothing and, like a good mouth trumpet. And he told me, he was like, hey, it's trumpet players, it's tough. He's like, we can get guitarists all day, but trumpet pl brass players, they're harder to get, they're more expensive, whatever. And I was like, really? Okay. And you knew you wanted trumpet, not sax, because, I mean, Merle. He he traveled with a sax player, not a trumpet player. But he had a he, he had some he, he, and like he more, had some trumpet solos and more like the Spanish, you know, influence songs. Actually, I was hearing trumpet more than I was hearing sax. Yeah. Like you know, like muffled, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Make, the thing on yeah, the end of yeah, it, yeah, definitely. And makes sense. So then we 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 actually talked to I talked to Ward, our friend Ward Roberts. Yeah. Uh, who you know he's he's actually pretty connected in the music world, and his dad's like a jazz player. So I was like, Ward, Trombone. we can't find any, and he was like, I, I know, and he sends me like a list. And uh, Chris Batista was the first person that we contacted and he was down to do the project. And he was like, what do you want me to play? And I said, well, I've already done a mouth trumpet <laughs> of the melody. And I was like, you can play that and then play some other stuff. And then at the end of the day, we just all liked just him doing exactly what I did with the mouth trumpet. So you got him to play a mouth trumpet. <laughs> that sounded like a real trumpet to me. I'm gonna play you the demo. This is the only demo I'm gonna play because okay. I want you to hear the final songs and I don't wanna be here forever, but I thought this was funny enough. You don't wanna be here forever? Uh, to, Where you gotta uh, be? To, pl to play you the, right. uh, the, demo the demo trumpet. All right. And you can also see, I'll play a little bit of the song to see just how, what I do ain't as good as what we do collectively once it gets in the hands of a producer. I know just enough about enough stuff to not when you bring something up talking out of my ass is my MO I'm trying to learn to say I don't know He did better than you, man. <laughs> His he mouth drop is a he lot He made better. that sound awesome. And then he put, the, he added the little. Yeah, 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 a little ending. Yeah, okay. so. 
That's flash of rationality. I mean, the melody was intact though. It's like, you know. It you didn't... played the same thing. I'm talking about your, your singing melody. Oh yeah, that one. And this is the second to last song written, by the way, the flash of rationality. Um, Okay. Because I wanted that theme of like, I started realizing that as you get into the album, I'm 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 flirting with, I mean, the whole thing is flirting with self-importance and self, you know, indulgence, but I just wanted to remind you that, hey, I don't think I'm some smart ass. I am, I am a smart ass. I'm more of a smart ass than a smart guy. So just wanted to remind you. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate you moving it to a disclaimer placement in your album instead of burying it. Yeah, right. And and also the fact that I it's one of my favorite songs on the album. Yeah, it's a good vibe. Yeah, you so can, you can walk you can walk down the street to it. Yeah, you can walk back the other way down the street to it. Third song is the third single uh, that just came out a week before the album dropped. Give a damn. Okay. Yes. Uh, so I put this one early in the mix as well, and it's v pretty big departure. Let's listen. Yeah, that's a good one, man. Uh, yeah, I had already heard Believe Me a lot earlier. I heard the first two singles. Really So early. by the time I listened to the album, this is the one that was like, <clears throat> let's see, we were on a plane. We were getting on a plane. You were listening to the album, we were in the airport. Yeah, it was one of those things where I had to, um, I had to leave my phone off airport mode, airplane mode. Even though we were taking off, because I hadn't, I was trying to right, get the trying last to finish the song finished, and then I'm like, "Man, what's gonna happen? Are right, somebody gonna come up to me and like kick me off this plane?" Yeah, they throw you right out the door. I just had to, I, you know, I had to get to start to finish. But then my first, you know, I leaned over to you. You happened to be there. It was such a, <laughs> such a coincidence, and I was like, "That was the." Give a damn. Now I was like, "Give a damn." Oh, that's the one right there. That's my. I mean, I listen to it again here. I'll tell you what's my favorite, but that was like the first one I wanted to talk about. Um, so let's talk about it. I mean, the guitar hook right off the bat. Did you do mouth guitar for that? Yeah, nope. See, that's was that my my thing was that what my guess is that was part of the solo, and then he you retroactively moved the second half of the solo to be the intro but uh, am i getting too in the weeds here well actually i don't know exactly i don't know what that process was exactly because it, you know obviously when i this is the one demo that when i sent it over i added a i yeah, you know i re recorded in logic and then derek is a pro tools guy but i did a beat i, I was like this is this is a rock song this is a this is a, like this is like in my mind, like an Avett Brothers rock song, because you've got oh, that kind of okay. like. Uh, now, but they don't do lead guitar in the same way. Mm -mm. Uh, but that's what I was hearing usually, and so uh, he's got that banjo. So, in I, it. so okay. I dropped a beat in there so that, to really so I could play with the groove, and it gives me the energy that I need to sing the demo. It's the only song that I did that on. Okay, and then and I was just like, listen, I want there's a, there's a couple of songs where I was like, I want Alex to let loose on this because if we need. We need something powerful and hooky on this. 
And, uh, you know, typically Derek would send me something and give me a couple of options. This he sent over and I was like, that's it. That's what, that that's that hook that it needed. Oh yeah, and it's very, I mean, it's interesting that you said it was rock because it didn't, it did not turn out that way. I mean, it it's, it's quite a jaunt to use the word that you used in the first song, but uh, well, it, folk rock. Yeah. That, that, okay. Avett Brothers. If you like, go to the wiki. It doesn't say they're a country band. It doesn't say they're a bluegrass band. It says they're a folk rock band. But the, you know, the, and I think this is a folk rock. Song. The specific, like the chicken picking of that intro. Yeah. It was that actually that was very uh, Merle to me. But I'm talking more '60s, which I I liked. I don't know if you even felt like that was a connection to me. But it was like I, I, wor working man's blues. I hear that. I also hear a, a hint of Leonard Skinner, like in well, me, it's a, yeah, slide, the slide lead. guitar, yeah, yeah, like yeah. it's this. But I mean, you could hear Jackson Brown, yeah, in that sure. too. So yeah. I would, you know, it's like you. Know, but yeah, I'm just I, saying I'll, it's interesting how I'll take a little Skinner. And then, uh, I mean, when you add that banjo, and then you add a bunch of fucks given. I mean, this is the explicit lyric song. Is, does it have? Is it going to have an E? On? Yeah. When I when I oh yeah you're, I, you're playing I the uploaded, Mumford and Sons card. When I uploaded the there's song, there's an explicit track on this this Mumford and Sons album. I it doesn't have to mean give as it much as listen. it used to. No, it doesn't. It doesn't mean as much as it used to. And also, I've noticed that like certain artists in this genre, who like if Father John Misty has says the F word in a song, he doesn't put explicit lyrics on it. <laughs> Interesting. I was like, well, I'm gonna do it. Okay, I'm gonna do it. Um, one last thing about the production, the gang vocals. Like, I just, yeah, it just felt like it was, it was such a relief when that showed up, when it, it just felt a relief? like. relief? Yeah, cause it just, I was like, oh, that's where this needed to go. You know, in a good way. Yeah, and that's just me and Derek standing in the in his studio, 12 feet from the mic. Just repeat it. Just me and you have done gang vocals a hundred times where we I try mean, to do it, multiple voices and stuff. Did you do any Muppet voices? I didn't. I hear said any I'm voices. not going to do the high voice because that makes it sound like the Muppets. I was like, that's one thing that I've learned from me and Link. Yeah, it was vocals. more, um, you know, friends in low places, people at a bar, kind of a vibe, kind of thing. Yeah, B yeah bar sing along. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely, it definitely that sealed the deal for me between the guitar at the opening and then the gang vocals at the end. But this song, I mean. It's about evangelism, right? Yeah. Because you talk about, you can be an evangelist of anything. It's just that we were very steeped in a church that had the label because it was such, so key to, to our And as system. I've talked about a lot of times, my personality is evangelistic. I like to persuade people, uh, and I don't necessarily like that about myself. And this is a song about, man, I can't help but give a damn, but sometimes I wish I didn't. You know, it's it's it doesn't make your life easier when you like to change people's minds. When you first heard about the great beyond, and also you yeah, were smitten. I think there's something about people who feel like there's got to be some purpose. They're naturally drawn to religion, and to really when they when they're involved in a religion, to really go for it. Like I became a missionary because I thought that this is the most important thing in the world. Like this is so much more important than every other earthly thing. That how do I go all in? Well, you because you do it full time, and so that's why I became a missionary. And so, and then what? Okay, go ahead. I have another question. And then so what? Um, yeah, but then when you're you switch teams, you become an evangelist for that team. Well, when you in this the second time you say it, it's not the great beyond. It's the first time what, I saw someone's, someone's eyes, light eyes light up. So, is that like catching the bug of of Converting somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, if I can sit down and talk to you, like, if you're if you're a conservative Christian, and I can have a conversation with you and make you question some fundamental things, and it seems like a light bulb goes off, um, there's something you know incredibly rewarding about that. It's the same part of your brain that lights up when you're evangelizing someone and they come to Christ. You think that you're doing it, and you might be doing it out of love and and belief that this person's soul is being saved, but it's an incredibly personally rewarding. If you were to scan somebody's brain who was having, was doing evangelism and someone was converting, the serotonin, you know, would be whatever the chem brain chemical is, you would be getting the, that reward. You would be getting the the reward that that you get 
from you know winning at a game. Dopamine, you know, it's a dopamine rush. Okay. So, and the, and that is in my personality. Get the dopamine molecule. So when I go to the other team, I and and again the 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 music video for this is out. The music video for this has currently not been finished, being made. It's an animated music video from uh, you're telling the future from Micah Buzan, who is this incredible animator who made the music video. And this is, you know, the song is a departure musically, and so the the visual is is very much a departure, and it, it's kind of symbolizing this and sort of a uh, as an analogy in a different world kind of thing. But the whole point just being that, again, the reason this is the third song is multi-purpose. Number one, it's like, hey, this is another place that we're going on this album. It's not just country. We're getting into some different stuff that is broadly country, but this Americana, folk rock, whatever you want to call it. But thematically, it's like, hey, I just told you that I'm not, don't take me seriously, because uh, I'm not taking myself as seriously as I might seem sometimes. But also, hey, I don't even like the fact that I want to change your mind. <laughs> I don't even like that about myself. It's making me age more quickly. Um, but I'm just, you know, I'm processing it through music. You're, the gray in your beard is, is started under the ears almost. And in the middle. And now in the middle. Yeah. And that's, you know, there's multiple reasons for that. So this section of the album, three songs. Okay. Where now that I've sort of thematically sort of tried to position myself a little bit as like, this is how I want you to kind of take what's about to come out before I start preaching at you because I am gonna preach at you before the end of the album. Now I'm directing my process towards people I love, starting with my parents, then going to my wife, and then going to my kids. Because spiritual deconstruction, which is an overused term, but you know what I'm talking about, basically moving away from traditional belief, sort of reorganizing the way you think about this, reorienting yourself, and in my case, deconverting. It's very complicated for the people that you love, especially if they are still in that faith, right? And so this is right. a song that was written as I process the way that I feel towards my parents and my parents feel towards me. It's called Sorry. I never set out to do something to Disappoint you approval was sort of my thing. Took your book and made it mine. Never colored outside the line and made my own peace with the king. But then the answer why do you feel like you need to say sorry in a song i don't know i don't <laughs> i don't have the answer i think this is something that anybody in this a similar situation like you love and respect your parents you grew you 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 um you were a good kid you know that this is a disappointment to them in spite of 
how well your life has gone or how well things are with your family and your career and all this stuff, if you disagree on this fundamental thing, it's a disappointment. You know, I think about my kids, and I tried to explain this to, to Locke to kind of get him to understand the dynamic here. Even though my parents really, really love me, um, because I have deconverted and publicly deconverted, it's kind of a double whammy. Mm-hmm. Not only am I no longer a Christian, but I'm this public figure who talks about it. Um, you know the world that we come from, and you know how those kids are seen, right? You know how people see me, and that impacts them. And the thing that I've, I'm trying to say in this song as well is that like, well, to finish that thought, I was like, Locke, if you know, we've kind of raised you according to a certain worldview, it's a much more permeable worldview than the one that I was given. Uh, I'm not telling you exactly what to think, but there are certain values and there are certain things that we hold, you know, leading with love and, and, and being kind of the main value. And I was like, if you were to like go off and become some guy who was like contrary to this, mm-hmm. you know, uh, in some way, there's multiple ways that you could do that. Like that would be difficult for me. But multiply that times ten when I would become worried about your eternal destiny. That's what my parents live with, and that's what the parents of many people who deconstructed and deconverted live with. Thankfully, we still have a great relationship, and we're we are we love each other, and love trumps everything else. Right? The love is stronger than the faith, which that's what Jesus Himself said. Right? Faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. If you lose the love, you've lost the plot. Hmm. Um. So, but I mean, that doesn't. I feel bad. Like the idea of my mom crying about me. Yeah. In my eternal destiny, that hurts. Yeah, it hurts you because it hurts her. Yeah, you know it. You know you you broke their hearts. Yeah, and you didn't do anything wrong, but you certainly don't. You know, the sign up sheet to break your parents' hearts is not something that people are lining up for. <laughs> and you and know, when I say- Espe- especially with the type of relationship that you have. You not only had but have with them that like yeah so you're able to say you did nothing wrong and what but I mean it's by hard that, for you to say they've done you know you've done they've done nothing wrong either the reason I say they've done nothing wrong is because again I know what it's like to be an evangelical Christian and when your kids depart not only do you like it's you, built you into can't... that community that you become responsible for it. The Bible, yeah. the Bible basically implies that in a couple of places that like your kid's outcome, I mean, it's it's a gray area for sure. There's ways to interpret it and get around it, but like regardless of what the Bible says, the evangelical community blames parents for what their kids end up doing. And so right. uh, that's, that's a feeling. It's like, you didn't do anything wrong. Like that's when I talk about the fact that, that's why I did that Instagram post. Like you guys taught me the gospel. I understand what the gospel means. I understand grace by faith. I'm not, I'm not legalistic. You guys were never legalistic. That's not, I didn't miss it, the boat in that way. I mean, it's, yeah, it kind of You didn't do anything think, wrong. And it's, it's not, it, 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 parents get a bad rap across the board, you know? It's like, why is so-and-so guilty of this crime or now in prison? It's like, well, how did, how did their, their parents fail them, <laughs> you know? Well, and I'll go a step further and say, not only did they not do anything wrong, they did a lot of things right. And this is a very difficult thing that I'm saying in this song that I can't, uh, you know, I haven't. The integrity that this. they gave you turned, burned a hole in your my, heart. My parents' concern with truth, especially my dad, because he thinks a lot like me. My dad became a Christian in his early 30s, so a, late, a later life conversion, right? So it was a very strong conversion that was immediately like impacted him in so many different ways. And my mom as well, they both became Christians at the same time. Mm-hmm. And his concern, his lifelong concern with truth and putting truth above everything else, my personality is exactly the same way. And the thing that I want to be able to say is that, hey, the same thing that got you to suddenly wake up in your early 30s and realize that life has got to be about more than just going through the motions. Like, there's gotta be more to this life. And, and that led you to making a profession of faith in Christ that was truly life-changing, I believe. 
That same instinct is what brought me to the conclusions that I came to. So it's actually what you did right, ironically, to make me really concerned about truth and like, hey, if this is the most important thing, I wanna understand, is it really true? And I came to my conclusion that I am at right now, I always leave room, I say right now because I leave a lot of things open, is that it's not true, fundamentally, it's not true. Christianity is not true. If I thought that it was true, I would still be a part of it. I don't think that it's true. I think that there's a lot of things about it that you can't know. And so, but what I'm saying is like, even though I I'm, made a lot of these decisions because of the good things that you passed along, I know it still deeply disappoints you, and I'm sorry about that. So the the part of like, why do I, feel like I need to say I'm sorry. Like, yeah, I, I, I think that, I know that resonates, that totally makes sense. And then, but let's talk about the in a song part. Why do I feel like I need to say I'm sorry in a song? You know, there's, are there certain things that you're saying in this song that you couldn't say to their face? Like, I think that applies to in this, a conversation. this song and many other ones, it's just not, I don't talk this way to to people directly. You know, even the next couple of songs we'll listen to, it's the same thing, it's like, I can say it a lot better in a song than I can just sitting down and saying it to you. Specifically with my parents, it's complicated by the fact that it's so emotional. Yeah. Um, and I can't have a real conversation about this, you know, without, especially my mom, like she's heartbroken, right? So it's, we just don't talk about this stuff directly. We We talk about the things that, you know, moms and sons talk about about life and what are the kids doing and, and that kind of thing. And maybe we will get where we can talk more directly about this stuff, but it's too hurtful. Yeah, because it's, I mean, there's, I mean, you say in the song that like neither, we're, we're probably not gonna change each other's minds. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So then you're left with just, just kind of, it becomes this emotional thing that, it you know it it still may be really raw yeah yeah um so what did you feel afraid to even to put the song out there or did you or is this like what do you are there hopes attached to it in terms of how you can process it in that relationship or is that none of none of none of the listeners business <laughs> Yeah, I would say that. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. You know. I, I think I'm. A lot of these songs are just as much for. You know. I'm. The reason I didn't just write this song and send it to my parents and I made it a public thing is because. Um. I think this will resonate. You know. I. This is. This is. This is happening. This is a. This is a worldwide, cultural movement of people moving out of these types of belief systems, that their parents hold very sacred and. It's difficult, and I, there's no solution in this other than like, hey, I'm just identifying with the emotion that this stirs in people. I think it's absolutely beautiful song in the way that it it resonates out even beyond the context of like changing your religious yeah. beliefs. You know, there's, and I think we've talked about this before. It's just, you know, you your relationship with your parent parents, guardians, like the people who, you know, people who are older than you as you grow up and you become an adult yourself, it's like the nature of our relationships change. And sometimes if they don't, that's 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 weirder than if they do, but the changes that you go through and that you know, people who love who love you and were there for you your whole life can't are they're making different decisions, they're landing in a different place. That's a it's a scary thing to 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 navigate a relationship where you have a fundamental disagreement. You know, you talk about issues of identity. Hmm. You know that whether it, it could still be religious, it could be, um, you know, relational, sexual, whatever the case may be. There's so much that you have to navigate. It's just I, I think it it's your story. And I think that it will resonate with other people's stories in a way that it just kind of it it sprouts wings, and that's why I think this is a beautiful song. Even if you're just doing um, 
the the spiritual exploration. I think it's a great album, but this is a standout because it's so relatable, sadly, to so many people. Yeah. And the irony is, is that yeah, it's you don't have a lot of the baggage like f- from your parents. I mean, we all have baggage, but like you, you. But ha- it's a lot worse you, for a lot of people. You have an active relationship where like you know you still want to spend time together at holidays and like you care about each other and it's not and a wall a, yeah. has not been built up you still have a relationship yeah and that's a and that and to you know listen i give them a lot of credit for that yeah because in the system that they're in it would not be there there are certain biblical passages that you could decide you were going to follow that would mean you would cut off a relationship and just to be honest with you mm. um and they're choosing love yeah and but that doesn't mean that this wasn't deeply uh emotional and uh difficult for you and for them yeah. it's like kind of you know it's under a best case scenario that it happened and it and you're still illustrating still, the depth yeah. with with which like there's parts that you you can only express in certain ways and like you're not you're not able to get into it still it's like i just think about the people who's like everything else mm. you know you, to add on to it so yeah i think it's a big one man and I wanted to put it there because you know it's that's one of my favorite songs on the album. Um, I just love the way that one came together uh, and to kind of start that section. Then, of course, the next song is the second single, which is me writing a song to my wife. It's called "Where We're Going." Picked up on it first thing You weren't like the ones I'd known Might have been from the same place But coming from somewhere all your own A few hours on a wooden bench That's all it took to do me in Knew then had to make it quick Before I made us fall into sin Said I don't know You know, it's amazing for a song that is so sweet to be about going through so much difficulty. Hmm. You know, uh, it because it is. I mean, especially when you throw that like classic country, and I don't mean in terms of time. I mean just like just the way that you know the sweetness of a sweet country song, especially when you go to that that bridge at the end or whatever you call it, where it's like, yeah. now I'm gonna put this all in perspective. It's like you fo- you followed this template, which is like, I'm telling you a story about a relationship. You can see the music video in your head. Typically, it would the country music singer would be singing. And you see the couple. And you, you see the couple and it wouldn't be them, but you did the right thing. You put yourself and Jesse in the, in the video. Right, yeah, so uh, that was, if you didn't know, that was Jesse singing. Uh, yeah, and uh, Ben Eck here, who's been at Mythical for almost a decade. You know, I, I, I wanted this whole thing to be outside of Mythical, but he was so excited when he heard about the project. He was like, "Hey, whatever I could do to help, I just want to be a part of it." And so we collaborated on the video, and he he, he brought it to life. But yeah, getting Jesse to sing again. I, I wrote this song for her for Valentine's Day two years ago or 2021, and uh, so then that was back before this album was a was a thing. It was before I even knew that I was making an album, really, and that it was, or that it was, it was a country album, right? 
So this song wasn't even conceptualized as a country song the first time I wrote it. You couldn't help yourself though. It, it was yeah. It, I remember you talked you, yeah. You talked about singing this song to her on this on the podcast. Yeah. you alluded to that. So yeah, kind of pre. This is the first song you wrote for the album. You didn't even know it. Well, it's not the first song I wrote because uh, I was just writing songs the as, first? A, as a process. The first song I wrote is the last song on the album, and I actually had this may be, this may be the second song that I that I wrote. Okay. Uh, but again, there was a number of songs there in in the middle that were. I didn't know I was making an album. I'm just writing, writing music and like recording demos. But you're, I mean, we, we've talked about it a lot when we talk about the deconstruction in the deconstruction episodes. But I mean, it just it it brings it into sharp focus how when your your relationship is built so strongly on the rock of Christ, right? That whenever you decide to move. Your home base somewhere else, uh, it that that is a scary prospect. And if you both but it, don't make that move together, and again, uh, we didn't make the move at the same time. Uh, you know, I kind of moved first, and then Jesse was, you know, obviously scared, resistant, crying. That's what I talk about in the song. It's just like when I started having these, like, this is what I'm thinking. I really didn't want to tell you about this because I know how much it'll upset you. She would just cry, you know. It was tough. It's one of the reasons it was such a long and lengthy process. But we eventually got to where we're not in exactly the same place spiritually, but we're. It isn't like she wants me to be anywhere or I want her to be anywhere. We both are like we're untethered from orthodoxy, frankly. Mm-hmm. And um, and it, it, but there's so many couples where that's not the case. You're in very different places fundamentally. And not only is that just intrinsically difficult, but you've been told, if you're from a conservative evangelical background, that you cannot be unequally yoked, that it doesn't work. And you're also told that everything that you have in life, every good instinct that you have, comes from God, comes from the Spirit of God, and everything bad comes from you. Uh, Again, this is, I'm not speaking for all evangelicals, but this is sort of the perspective that I had. All your good instincts are from God, all your bad instincts are from you. And what that means is that the moment that you begin thinking that this God thing may not make sense in the same way, you're just naturally programmed to think that only bad is now left. And now what are we gonna base this marriage on? Love? (laughs) I thought we had to base it on Jesus So. This is an example of some of the things we were warned about turned out to be pretty good. You know, there there was a lot of trepidation. Like I definitely relate with me and Christy and our spiritual journeys. Like the trepidation of everything that you realize you believed if it wasn't, I mean, it was overtly taught in a lot of ways like you're talking about the unequally yoked thing, but and just how it permeates. Yeah, every everything you you don't even know you believe. Uh yeah. is you know it you can feel it as fear before you can state it logically and when you're in a deconstruction process it's like yeah you're in this you're in this state of fear a lot of times and you can't articulate it and but to get through that with anything that you get through at, as as a couple and you if if you do come out stronger on the other side then you can say oh wow there's part this is Maybe it was worth it, you know, right? Can't you say that? I think that um, when you strip away the ideology that was holding you together and it really becomes about just love um, and this commitment, and I'm not, again, I know I give a lot of these disclaimers. I'm not saying that people who are Christians who are in a relationship that it is all about, like it isn't about love, it's just about their ideology. The thing I would say, I, that I would challenge Christians on is, I actually think that you know a lot of guys in Christian circles, this is what you hear. They're like, man, if I didn't, if I wasn't a Christian, I'd be cheating on my wife. This is a very common sentiment. And I'm like, dude, that's some fucked up shit, man. Like think about what you just said. Yeah. Think about what you just said. What if the reason you don't cheat on your wife is because you love her? 
Like, yeah. like how about, how about and, and here's what I would say. I think the reason, because here's the deal. Infidelity happens a whole lot with inside and outside of the church. It seems like that commitment actually doesn't play much of a role. And so if you are faithful, I think it actually means that you're faithful. You don't have to constantly give credit to some external source for every good thing you do. Maybe you're faithful because you have the ability to be faithful in yourself. And you know, so, so that is an example of like, oh, this relationship that is, and I, listen, I'm not perfect, Jesse's not perfect. I'm not saying that it's always gonna be great. It has continually gotten better over the years for us as we've grown together. But who knows what, what what challenges we'll meet, you know? But when the rubber meets the road, I want to our relationship to be based on mutual love and respect and a commitment that is independent of our worldview and ideology. And well, you know, uh, and I think that that's actually the case in most relationships, even the ones where the ideology is ideology is present. What do you mean by more than a savior we needed help? Cuz it's you know, I think from the I don't know. That that's more of a head scratcher. Um, what I meant by that is, in the in the evangelical circles that we ran around in, um, you get a lot of help from a spiritual perspective, right? Like, and even when you go to therapy or you go to couples counseling, it's always run through this very specific biblical grid. Uh, and it's just like, if your relationship with Christ is intact and flourishing, then everything else in your life will be okay. It's kind of the implication, right? And I think there are some times when you just need help. You just actually need somebody to help you navigate your relationship, navigate your own emotional and mental well-being. You know, I t and I, it's funny, because I, I, I know Christians who, uh, prefer for their therapist to not be a Christian because they don't want it run through this biblical grid, which a lot of times is more hurtful than helpful. So I, th I think that the point there is that like, hey, it isn't just about getting saved and having this savior, the saving knowledge of Christ. It's like, no, like couples need help. They just don't need to be right with God. They need to figure the <laughs> They need to figure out how to navigate a relationship. Um. And I think what we needed each individually in our in our own circumstances and, and situations, but also as, as a couple, like we needed to work on us apart from just getting our worldview straightened out. Like that isn't, that's not, it's just not the case. It's just not true that if you get the right belief, you know, so much of conservative evangelical Christianity is about believing the right things. You go to church on Sunday and what do they talk about? Well, hold on now. We're not to the preachy, I can't help preachy myself. songs yet. I mean, we're getting there. Uh, so, and that's our experience is that, hey, when we actually started thinking about our relationship and thinking about each other rather than God, things got better. <laughs> What's next? This is the third in this three song section to People I Love, and this is the song that I wrote for my boys. Okay, buckle up called Creaking Back. Why so 
Another tearjerker. Come on now. This so those three together, you just want everybody to cry. Yeah. Everybody, now, yeah, it's got wings, man. Like I said, in just like I was talking about before, you know, any any parent's gonna say, Oh God, I know exactly I know exactly what that feels like to just should I say that I am I'm clueless. I'm just as clueless as you, but in a different way, hmm. you know? Um, it's it's extremely powerful to to, to put that out there. I, I know it's gonna resonate with people and the piano doesn't hurt. Yeah, I wanted to do, <laughs> I wanted to, you know, do a piano song and it's not me playing the piano. I know that I learned how to play the piano for, hmm. the, for a tour we did, but that's a, a real piano player, uh, Eden Dover, um, and, of course, I you know I wrote it on guitar, but I was I, I I was hearing it as as piano, and then, and also it's kind of interesting because this is the kind of music that like it's a little more, you know, it's piano based. So you're kind of getting into you know it's not like a Billy Joel or a, a you know an Elton John song, but it's the most like that of anything on the album, which is kind of like music that we've connected I've connected with the boys over. Um, but yeah, exactly. This is just, I had written those two songs to, you know, a song to my parents, a song to my wife, and I was like, you know, I think that when you have a fundamental shift in worldview, like again, held you up before God and man, the first, this is, that's the dedication, which in, incidentally is a piece of video in the, in the, in the home video footage in the Where We're Going music video. Oh, wow. Is meet us up there in front of the church with Locke. Yeah. And so which is a ceremony arguably just as much if not more about the parents than it is about It's basically the kids. saying you get up in front of you get up in front of everybody and you say I promise to raise this kid. You respond to a series of questions. I'm raising this kid uh you know according to the gospel and to raise them to serve Jesus and to make a decision. Yeah, uh, I mean, in my church, my my kids were actually baptized, and there was an added thing of well, like, that didn't save them, Link. That if they, you know, that clinging to this promise that's open to interpretation, that's like okay, they are already saved as long as every everybody does their job. Well, you're kind of claiming them for Christ, you know. Um, to me, this song is more powerful knowing at what stage of fatherhood you wrote it. Because I, I think there's a lot of artists that will have a child and then of course they're gonna start writing songs about their baby. There's, there's so many songs, like an endless playlist of this artist that you know had their first baby and then they had to write a song That's about Sturgill's it. whole album, uh, Sailor's Guide to the universe or whatever it is, it's like it's all based on him having a kid. I mean, uh, this Childish Gambino, I mean, it, but it's, you're looking at this baby and you're like, ever since the day I brought you home, I've been scared shitless, mm -hmm. you know? So for you to say that and, you know, Locke is off at college. Thank God. I, and and Shepard's not, not as far behind as it seems like, you meaning, know, so meaning it's- that it it happened. I don't mean I'm thankful he's gone. I'm saying that like he got there. So my you, you see my point, right? I mean yeah. it's 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 strangely comforting as a parent to hear this, knowing that you're you've got you've got kids that are, that are on the cusp of, of adulthood. Well, I think it goes back to what we've talked about as we as we talk about relating to our kids that. It's much less about the things that you say and much more about the things that you do. 
and you know, I think modeling cluelessness <laughs> to my children, that's a harsh way to put it, but modeling humility or whatever, however you wanna say it, like, hey man, everything that we've done has been motivated by love, but it's all guesswork, and it's the best guess that we have at the time. And I know for a fact that you're going to be processing the mistakes that I've made forever. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Hopefully, because this, I mean, the song is for them first, right? Hopefully, just hearing that is helpful to them. I'm so glad. You don't, you don't end up with a bunch of resentment. You know, a parent who can't yeah. admit that they made a bunch of mistakes, that is much more trauma inducing than the mistakes sometimes. Yeah, I mean, it definitely piles it on. Yeah. I'm glad that you didn't go like cute country and then change I love you to the creek and back to in the final chorus saying, I love you with my creek and back. Like, oh, I'm so it. old. Got it. That would, well, my back sounds like a door. That would have been a it's bad not too late. mistake. It's not too late. It is too um, late. Where are we going? Now, well, where, we, where, we, where we're going is, uh, that was the song I wrote to Jesse. You said, where are we going? Oh. I mean, that's a song title. What song is next? Well, I do, I do, before we move on, I wanna say, so obviously that was Jesse singing along with that song as well. So Jesse sings on three songs. She's the mother of those um, children. And so she did an amazing job there. And uh, thanks to, there's, you know, we wanted to do the cello and the violin, the strings were like a last minute addition because we had just an electric bass in there that Derek had played. And I was like, oh, I'm hearing something else. And then I heard a song, I was listening to some song and it was piano and cello. I was like, that's what we need. So we got Dave Egger to play cello and Lisa Faco to play violin. So thank you for that, making that song what it is. Now we're getting back into, uh, this song is called Only Thing. Uh, and this is again, sort of back to the processing because I'm about to move into a place where I'm not really singing to individuals, but I'm more kind of in my own head and then finally directing some things out to the church. Got a couple of songs that are directed at the church towards the end, but this is back to like processing. Okay. Only thing. I could argue with the best of them about where we came from Convince you over coffee That Jesus was God's son Take that empty feeling That everybody feels And use it against you Till you were on your heels I was sure as sure can be I was working for eternity There was hell to pay If you saw it another way Now the only thing I'm certain of Is that I ain't certain about much It's easy to be right It's not so easy to choose love Sometimes I So it's sometimes it's it's I don't think you said sometimes you said it's easy to be right. So you said sometimes it's not easy to choose love. So you're talking about this. It's easy to be right. It's not so easy to to, to choose love. So it's like that's the that's the struggle, right? 
that I mean that's what you're speaking from experience here. Yeah. This one is just kind of that I I think that it's very difficult when when you're a Christian. Um and I would say when you adhere to any particular religious philosophy and you really adhere to it, like you're pretty sure that you're right about it, right? Like being right about it is kind of important. There's a lot at stake. Um, specifically, I mean, under, you know, believing the creed, they're, they're believing the right thing about Jesus is, is the ticket to heaven, right? I mean, ultimately, when you break it down, you gotta think and believe the right, you gotta believe the right thing. And your eternal destiny depends on that. And I think that it's difficult when you're in that situation to envision what it would be like to just not be sure about that. That was one of the scariest things for me as a, when I was transitioning away from Christianity, which is like, whoa, like this is so crazy to like n- just accept the fact that you don't have to know what you think about this stuff, that you can yeah. be uncertain about this stuff. Um, and it's really hard. It's like, that's why it says uh, in, in the course, it's like, I'm, I'm trying to, essentially, I'm trying to break the habit of, of knowing what life's all about, right? That's, that, that's, a, that's a tendency to like, you gotta know what life's all about and you gotta believe it strongly and you've gotta share it. And you gotta, and it's difficult to be like, no, I can let go of that. I don't have to know what the ultimate purpose of the universe is. And I believe that anyone who says that they've got it figured out almost assuredly is wrong. Like the one thing I know is if you say you know what the secret of the universe is and what the purpose of all this is, whatever your particular take on it, you're basically ruling that out from being the truth because you've come up, you know, you and some system of man has come up with that from my perspective. I think when, from my experience, when love takes a close second, like, even if it's a razor edge, like like a thin slice just below truth, it, it's a problem. It's a problem when you start to relate to people, when you start to try to empathize with people. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's hard to love somebody when it's, there's a subservience to what you believe to be an absolute truth. And it always felt weird. And that's why for so many years I would hide like my my beliefs and my affiliation with the evangelical church was because I just couldn't stand by the implied judgment that was the headline. It's like too many people I, I feared would associate with me with, with judgment and not love first. Yeah. And I realized that like I related to a lot of people for some so much of my life with love being subservient and people can feel that shit. They know it. They know it. It sticks out like a sore thumb. Oh yeah. And it's like Yeah, I mean that that's that's one of the big things that you know finally kind of broke me out of that thinking was like, just like it's not something to hide, it's something to break up away from. Well, you know, interesting, I've been thinking about this exact concept a lot lately, um, and I the way I've kind of, the way I understand it right now is, if something about your particular ideology or philosophy makes you necessarily think that someone is Fundamentally different, right? So if, you, if you're a Christian, if you're an evangelical Christian, and what I mean by that is if you believe that the only way to be in a right relationship with God is through Jesus Christ. And so if you're not in a right relationship with Jesus Christ, you are condemned. You're not really a child of God, right? You're gonna spend eternity in hell. If I believe that about you, even if I love you, I think less of you by default. I'm, I think that I'm gonna spend eternity with God and I think that you are not going to spend eternity with God. 
Sure, it may be because of grace and it may be because of the gospel. I'm not, it doesn't make you a bad person to believe that, but the, the relational dynamic that that creates is that this person who's on the receiving end of that judgment is what it is. It is a judgment, it is a, it is a determination. You, their relationship can only be so deep with you. So if you're a Christian and you think that I'm going to hell, again, you may be, that is your, that's your theological opinion, you can't help yourself believe that, but what I'm saying is that I can only have so deep of a relationship with you because there's a fundamental thing that you believe about me that separates us and ultimately results in me being discarded and judged in a way that you're not going to be. And that's just a difficult dynamic uh, that is a result of fundamentalist belief about things. But the moment you say, hey, this is my take, but I'm not really that certain about it and I'm not prepared to say that you're condemned, the relational possibilities really open up. That's a difficult thing to do though. It's a very difficult thing to do if you if you hold to a particular theology. What do we head next? So this is the biggest departure. This is the last song that I wrote uh, and I wanted there to be what I would call a badass country song. <laughs> and uh, I'll explain what it means and why it's in this spot on the album after we listen to it. It's called Kill a Man. Can just say it, man. Just, just freaking say it. This, say it what? This one's about me. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> this is me letting you know that I'm nah, going this, to kill you. This is this is a badass blues guitar. You got some uh, Kenny Wayne Shepherd in here. Well, it, this you got the, the low notes. You got the high well, notes. Well, here's the thing. This song was never going to be a part of the album. I thought I was done with ten songs. Then, as we kept producing this thing and Alex kept coming through and I was like, this dude's really talented. Oh yeah, he did awesome. And I was like, I just feel like I've gotta write a song that lets him, is this like, hey, hey buddy, I'm taking off the leash. I'm taking off the leash and I just want you to be a badass on the guitar and just do what you can do. Yeah. And so thematically, I mean, the, the message is, and I don't wanna, uh, let me just say, I'm not gonna say exactly. There's a principle that was true in my former philosophy as a Christian that is true now as a whatever I am, hopeful agnostic, uh, that I think is an important principle in life uh, that I still abide by, and this song is a sort of uh, an exploration of that concept. Okay. I'll let you figure out exactly what that is. But, uh, and thanks to Jessie for lending her. Um, Operatic vocals. Yeah, you know, she's done that for us before back in the day. This is, you know, Jessie majored in, in voice, specifically classical voice. So we knew, I knew I wanted that middle section to be like kind of a weird departure and there's like some backtracked guitars and stuff or whatever the term is for what re it, reverse. What guitar. are the backing vocals that sound like a chant say? Are they words? Where's Which that? part? Huh. Huh, it's like a percussive. Oh, they just say, yeah, yeah. They say, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, all right, glad we cleared that up. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a, it's a little bit of a, 
again, I don't think there's a Jack White song that sounds exactly like this, but you could imagine him having done something sure, like this. Sure. You know, and 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 that's Derek doing that percussion. He just did it like outside of his studio in Burbank, like on his driveway, with like. You sounds know. like you're you're you've killed somebody and you're dragging them you're dragging them to the yeah well it's kind of like you've got somebody and you've and you've uh, you've got them in shackles and you're taking them taking them to kill them you know oh that's more it's kind of the you know you could take it however you want to but that was what I was thinking uh, now we get final three songs these two that I just put together originally I wanted them to be spread out and then I was just like I've kind of set the stage to. These are my two songs directed at the church. Okay. The first one is called In Vain. There's quite a few things you don't seem to mind. I'm trying to figure out just where you draw the line. Cause watching people die. Seems to be fine, but God forbid a nipple or a Jesus Christ. I sort of understand. It took me quite a bit before I'd let an oh my God exit from my lips. Maybe that commandment about using the Lord. About a lot more than just what you say. So much done in Jesus' name. Seems to me to be a goddamn shame. Are you sure the Savior came? So See, I feel like there's gonna be a lot of people, Christians, who are like, hey, I I agree with all of that, man. I agree with all of that. I think it's, it's it's difficult, though, in practice. I mean, I'm just saying from from personal experience to to go from, yes, it's, you know, Jesus' teachings and the, the bi biblical teaching can be, you know, we want to just boil it down to this actionable stuff where we can check boxes. I know for me, I wanted to be able to check boxes and say, I'm well within bounds. I'm, I, I can feel secure about my approach to life and um, with rules. And that's not how Jesus talked, right? And so, and I was taught enough of that to know, to try to counteract it, but I mean, with my tendencies, it's, you know, I, I tended to really, when it when you boil it down to rules and even if it's frivolous ones, like, okay, don't say damn, but definitely don't say goddamn, and like, uh, don't say, oh my God. You know, it's like, it just, it makes it easier to process, but none of this stuff is that easy to process. It should it shouldn't be, you know. But as humans, I think we 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 at times you just fall back on this reductionist approach. Well, I think it's you know I've always been fascinated with how offensive using God's name in vain. God damn, saying God damn is so. And this is something I tell people from other parts parts of the world and from other parts of the United States. I'm like, if you like, if you get upset about something, and you say Jesus Christ, like that is like, oh, like it, it, certain evangelical Christians, it's like, it's like a poison, man. It is so offensive to them. And I'm like, it's so interesting to me that that is the thing that is so offensive, but there's all this other stuff that is actually offensive that you don't care about. Hey, we, I, yeah, I heard it. You listed them out. And, Nipples. 
Well, I remember nipples. And I just, you know, it's just it's always been fascinating to me. Can and I it, see this music video? This is the one I want to see. It's just one nipple the whole time, so. A, can it sing? It's a singing nipple, yeah. Like where the milk comes out, it can actually start singing? Yeah, that's, yeah, the nipple part. Um, So I don't know, I just, I, I, I wanted to say, because it's like, you're right, I think well, there's you lots said, of Christians who would be like, I agree with this, but were you gonna play it for somebody? Because it says God damn in it a number of times. You know, and again, I'm, not all Christians are like this. A lot of Christians have woken up to the fact that like, hey guys, like cursing, and even saying like, do you really think that that's what that commandment was about? Like, you think the commandment to not use God's name in vain was about not using God's name as a curse word? Like, you really think that's what that commandment was ever about? It's so interesting that it's what it became about. Um, but you're totally right. Most reasonable Christians of all stripes will be like, yeah, yeah, I completely agree with this. Like, that's not what the gospel's about. It's not about all these other things. Um, so yeah, again, I, my, my, um, yeah, I think this is. I think ultimately this is all pretty like soft stuff. It's not, you know. I, that my the point of this album was not I mean, to, this, to condemn. It's just the I, Supreme Court case. I mean that. I mean that's something that. We, I mean, I think it. There's a couple places where it. Oh, it starts to hit. Well, a and this hard. song was written before the the Roe v. Wade. Over, that was overturned. This, it what even it wasn't in, in anticipation of that particular case even. There's always a Supreme Court case that Christians think that God is on the side of an issue and that that's what Jesus would believe. And that's probably the best one is that they just fundamentally believe Jesus would be pro-life, no questions asked. And it's just like, really though? Like you really think that? Show me the biblical evidence of that. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, I think this is, again, it's not like I'm expect, like if you're a Christian and you're a conservative Christian and you completely fundamentally disagree with me and you've made it to this point in the album, it's like, okay, these these songs may be challenging for you. But again, this wasn't about, hey, this is a message for the church first and foremost. I am, it, it is, but it's more like, when you are deconstructing or deconverting, like, there's a lot of things that you're thinking and you're beginning to see things. You're like, man, like this was the way that it always was. We, this is how we thought. We were so offended by this thing, but yet all this other stuff didn't offend us. And that's weird and, and, and hip hypocritical. And you just see it and you wanna talk about it and you wanna say it. You wanna point out the hypocrisy. Um, but this next song, Fruit, is even more specifically about what I see as the hypocrisy in the church. Don't know much about the carpenter He lived in a very different time but Most everything that I've heard he said Makes me think we might be reading different lines There was something about turning the other cheek I can't quite square that with your AR-15 He said, let the little children come to me You just watched as they were torn from their family I don't feel the love I don't see the joy But I'm not sure I got the patience To argue anymore I don't mean to be unkind And I'd like to keep the peace Just looking for the self-control This one hits hard, man. Where's the love? I don't feel the love. I mean, it's 
if if somebody honestly says that, I mean, you just can't, it's undeniable. You know, if somebody doesn't feel loved, you know, it's, what can you say to that? It's it's one thing for someone to say, yeah, but I love you. It's like, um, you know, I just think even on like in an intimate relationship, have you ever been in a point when you're like, uh, someone you love told you, I don't, I don't feel the love. It doesn't. I don't. I'm not feeling that from you. It's like, good luck coming up with a response. You know, hmm. the damage is already done. Like the writing's on the wall, and you can you can ex- try to explain yourself at that point. And I feel like that's that's this resonates with me so much because it's it, it's I don't know. I just. I just see it. It's it's frustrating, and I don't want to. I don't want to paint with a broad stroke and say like, yeah, this is the problem with the church overall. And like, did you really put words in my mouth? I think that it's, you know, you you, you give some examples in there when you talk about AR fifteen. When you talk, you, you allude to immigration um, uh, practices. Um, yeah, I, uh, what. Who's the red letter crowd? Like define that because I think at that point you're talking about infighting within the church. I was like, I'm you, talking can't about. Even... I'm talking about my perspective, my my former self's perspective on progressive Christians. Right. I used to be like, so red letter Christians is a thing that is people who identify with the words of Jesus because there are some versions of the Bible where all the words of Jesus are in red and all the rest of the words are just black. Right. And so there are people who say, I'm a red letter Christian. And what that means is that the thing that I hold the most sacred and the thing I really take seriously is the words of Jesus. And then everything else is sort of open to interpretation or not as important. Okay. Um, And thinking that way makes you, uh, you know, Jesus didn't condemn a whole lot besides hypocrisy, (laughs) right? He didn't go around, he, he he got condemned by the religious zealots because he was hanging out with the people he shouldn't hang out with, right? And he didn't come with a really judgmental tone. He was like, I'm, I'm about building relationships, I'm bringing love into the situation. And so it's essentially a way of saying, hey, I used to be like progressive Christians are whack because they're just not comfortable with the whole truth. They're taking the truth that they're comfortable with that kind of fits into our cultural context and is culturally acceptable. And then they're kind of minimizing or even rejecting the difficult truths that our culture actually needs to hear that are in the Bible. And I was like, you can't just say, I want this to be true and this is uncomfortable, so I'm not gonna make that, I'm not gonna believe that. I used to look down on them. And now I'm like, those are the people I'm rooting for within the church is the ones who are saying, yeah, 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 I am prioritizing love over judgment. I am prioritizing love over faith even, believing the right thing. Um, because it's not so much like, you know, because you, you might say what you said earlier when you were like, when you say I love you, but it's very difficult. And, and a Christian might say, yeah, but I love you, but I think that what you're doing is sinful. Like, I can't not say that. If you know, I have to tell you that if I think something you're doing is wrong, I don't think we're talking about that situation. That can get complex, you know. I think what we're talking about is the fact that as a whole, the evangelical church, especially in America, has aligned itself with like the darkest parts of our nature uh, uh, as a country, right? Like you aligned yourself with Donald Trump. I mean, I did a whole podcast about this. I don't care what the outcome was. I don't care if the Supreme Court case went the way that you wanted it. You aligned yourself with someone who is the least Christ-like politician to ever have been in power in the United States of America. Full stop, not an exaggeration, not hyperbole. You aligned yourself with the least Christ-like politician to ever have been in power in the history of our country. I don't feel the love. The most reliable indicator for support of Donald Trump in this country is if you are a conservative evangelical Christian. That is the most reliable indicator. As long as that's true, you guys have lost the plot. You've lost the love. Full stop. 
That's what the song is about. Well, you said full stop. I can't, I can't, I can't say anything else. You said full stop twice. Yeah, full stop. Said it three times. Well, I mean, it, 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 we didn't even talk about the fruit illusions. They can get that themselves. Fruit of the Lee illusions. Right, yes, fruit of the spirit. Um, there's only one more song. All right. What? It's called Old Letters, and it is the first song that I wrote of all these songs. Wrote it in 2019. I still remember when we used to talk You never said much But I knew what you thought Cause you wrote it down for me Long ago I read your letters to keep from feeling alone There's not just one thing I could point to That began to push me away from you All I could say is that I changed It was just like you to stay the same Stay the same So the first song you wrote is the last one on the album. It makes sense to me that the first song you wrote is a letter to God, unless I'm getting this really wrong. No, Link, this is to you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all of his letters to you, this is your letter to him. Um, as you're starting the journey, it seems like that's a good starting place. Like if you were, when you told me this is what you wrote first, that's why it and makes it wasn't, sense to me. It, it wasn't written as the first of, of a set of songs. It was just like, oh, I've never, I never write, I never write about complex emotions. I, we write comedy songs, you know? I'm, I, this might be the first serious song I've ever written. Well, maybe like back in the day when we were writing like Christian music. Um, well, yeah, that's true. Yeah, you know, back in high school. But um, yeah. It, it was very much just, I'm processing this thing that is, this is kind of how I think about God. It feels like a, it feels like a breakup. It feels like you, you think about the relationship that you had and you run things back through your mind and you're like, what was I, how, what was I actually thinking? What was going on? But the reason I, you know, I, this is the last song on the album is, you know, I am committed to being open. Like I, I am, I have not closed my accounts with reality. I have not closed my accounts with God. I don't, I'm not an atheist, and the reason that I say I'm not an atheist is because I lean into the idea that there's something else going on here. You know, I don't know what that is. I don't know what the nature of that is. I don't know what the nature of God is. I don't know what the nature of the universe is, but I don't know what it is, and so therefore I'm not ready to conclude what it is. And it may be that I had got, the first time around, when I was in a relationship with God, as I would have described it, I, I had him wrong. I had her wrong. I had it wrong. I had them wrong. Whatever you want, however you want. And who knows what the future holds, right? If the last 20 years of my life indicate anything, is that the next 20 years could send me in a wildly different direction than I would have ever anticipated. And so the last thing I wanna do is close myself off to if, if that God out there, in there, around there, is wants to be in relationship and wants to reveal some kind of truth to me, I'm not gonna be the one to stand in the way of that God doing that. And so I leave it open and unresolved. I enjoyed the uh, production technique of like the, the panned vocals, but is there irony in the fact that y your processing of God's letters is like a conversation with yourself. Well, the, so there's a song, a Jason Isbell song that I love, uh, Chaos and Clothes, I think is the name of it. And uh, he does this technique of basically doubling his voice and the stereo split of the two voices. And I knew I wanted to do a song like this and I thought that this song was a perfect one to do it because it just represents 
the possibility. To me, it's not some, I, I, it is interesting that you take it that way, which I'll, I'll take that. I'm not taking credit for it, but like, is this just a conversation with myself? This is why this is the only song on the album where I did my own harmony, because I was like, this is so personal that it's like, there's, so there's two melodies and there's two harmonies and there's two guitars. And it's just like, represents the multiple perspectives and how, where we go from here is something that is just kinda, it's open. It, it, the, the, the possibilities are open and I, and I don't know, I'm not trying to go any particular place. Well, I, you know, I, I celebrate the fact that this thing exists, is out there, it's a complete project. I mean, I know with everything that you've been through and how the pandemic in a lot of ways gave you the space to make this possible, there's still a lot of stuff that's going on and more every day. It's like, it's nice that you, f you followed through on this vision and this is out there and it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it'll outlive you. You mean it's still gonna be on the internet after I'm dead? Oh yeah, that's great. I mean that you, as a as a project, I think it's it's important, and I I celebrate it. Well, thanks thanks for that, and thanks for listening to it with me. Um, I, you know, I think that the the most rewarding part so far has been the people who, and again, I'm still when I record this, the there's, horrible cover songs. There's, there's only. <laughs> There's been a lot of great cover songs. Uh, there's only two tracks out at the time that I record this, you know, the first two singles. But the most rewarding thing, and again, this is what I said from the beginning, if one person is like, ah, I, I relate to this, like you, you wrote a theme song for my life situation or what I've been through in this relationship, um, that's been the most rewarding thing, is people giving that feedback and saying that like, this is, you put into words what I've been feeling and thinking and haven't been able to say, you know? And again, I talked about uh, part of the inspiration for this album being um, David Bazan, Pedro the Lion, uh, and specifically his, his, uh, his album, Curse the Branches, which is di obviously different musically and different thematically, but it was like a deconstruction album from way back in the day, before I, when I was in the very beginnings of my deconstruction, uh, and it was just so like, I, I kept, I listened to that album so many times because I was like, man, people, don't, I just didn't, there wasn't enough music out there that resonated with specifically this very difficult thing that I was dealing with. Mm -hmm. So, and more people are doing it. There's more deconstruction. Again, I hate to use the word, it's overused, but it's the best descriptor. Uh, there's more and more music that connects with, the, with everybody who's experiencing this stuff. But I just wanted to do my part to get it out there. So thanks for listening. Do you happen to have a wreck? It's your week. Um, uh, I guess if I have Can to, you wreck if I have to search I deeply, know. I would say that I recommend that you listen to my album. Human Overboard is the name of the album. James and the Shame is the name of the artist. That's me. And uh, it is available everywhere you stream music. And I will ask, you know, it's funny. I don't know what it'll be like by the time this comes out. But I see on like on Spotify, like pe people also like, and everybody who they also like is like another internet famous person who does music, <laughs> which I guess is inevitable that that's what the case is. But I would just say, hey, listen, if this album was your introduction to country or Americana, uh, hey, there's a lot of really good stuff out there. You know, I put together that playlist a while back that was like some of my inspirations. Listen to that music, not only for your own benefit, because there's a lot of great country music that's out there, but also it'll start to show up that people also like country music, <laughs> <laughs> not Ninja Sex Party. Nothing against Ninja Sex Party, we love those guys, uh, but I don't think that Ninja Sex Party is the greatest entry point into James and the Shame. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> so do some listening to train the algorithm if you don't mind. All right, as always, you can call us, leave us voicemail, give us your reactions. We play them at the end of every episode, so stick around for those, One eight eight. EarPod1, hashtag Ear Biscuits. Hi, Rhett and Link. This is Natalie Calm from Ontario. Um, I went on my YouTube music today and it told me that I have listened to James and the Shame 987 minutes, um, which is about 16 hours um, over the course of two songs. 
just wanted to let you know that I love the music and I can't wait for the rest of the album. Thank you so much for putting it out there. Hey guys, um, first of all, love the show, longtime fan. Super stoked to hear your full album. Congrats on it, dude. First three songs were great. Love you guys. Thanks. Bye. Brett, keep my evening listening to your song, Where We're Going, and bawling my eyes out. I'm 36 years old. My wife is 35. I have two boys, 10 and 8. This past Memorial Day weekend, she had a stroke. And she's been working incredibly hard in rehab to regain the use of her left side and various mental blocks still. Needless to say, this has been a whirlwind and scary last few months. My days are quite long now keeping everything afloat and moving forward for my boys and for her. And this song just perfectly embodies how much I love my wife and how much I am still just so happy to be with her and look forward to sharing our lives together no matter what happens along the way. I was just so moved and compelled by this song, I I had to share this with you, Rhett. And you know how much your music is impacting people. Thank you both for everything you give to us and everything you share with us. To watch more Ear Biscuits, click on the playlist on the right. To watch the previous episode of Ear Biscuits, click on the playlist to the left. And don't forget to click on the circular icon to subscribe. If you prefer to listen to this podcast, it's available on all your favorite podcast platforms. Thanks for being your mythical best.